So we've talked about indirect calorimetry, and we've talked about how it can be a tool to estimate caloric expenditure. Now we're going to say a little bit more about um, the limitations of using indirect calorimetry. So as I said in the last recording, indirect calorimetry is most accurate at rest and during steady state exercise. We haven't talked about steady state yet, but for now, it's, it's a low to moderate intensity. It's an intensity that somebody can maintain for an extended period of time. And the reason why it's most accurate under these conditions is because it depends on all of the linear relationships in this formula here. Okay, so remember that what we're doing is we're trying to estimate how much work we're doing, energy expenditure. And we're doing that by estimating heat production because the more ATP we produce, the more heat we produce. These two things are linearly related to each other. But with indirect calorimetry, we're not actually measuring heat. We're measuring another variable, which is VO2, okay? um, oxygen consumed or oxygen used. And the reason that we can measure o VO2 and use it to estimate heat is, again, because all of the things in this formula here are linearly related. Okay? As we use more fat and carbohydrate and more oxygen, we produce more ATP, CO2, water, and heat. Okay? So oxygen use is really easy to measure. So we measure oxygen. Okay? Uh, we use it to estimate heat production, and we quantify heat production as caloric expenditure, and that gives us an idea of how much ATP we're using or how much work we're doing. So we really rely heavily on these linear relationships, okay? And these, all of these things occur linearly if the primary ATP production is aerobic. Okay, because what we've drawn here, this is aerobic ATP production, right? Fat and carbohydrate, oxygen and ETC, we get ATP, we get CO2 from the intermediate step and from Krebs, we get some water throughout, and we get some heat, okay? But if the exercise became more intense, let's say we went to a, a higher end of the moderate intensity category or we even went into high intensity exercise, what's going to happen is we're going to start producing more and more ATP anaerobically. Okay? And so what's going to happen is ATP is going to increase but oxygen use is not because anaerobic ATP production doesn't use oxygen. So we lose the linearity between oxygen use and ATP. So we can no longer measure oxygen use and use it as an estimate of um, energy expenditure or ATP use. So it can only be used accurately when aerobic ATP production is the primary means of getting ATP. So the higher the intensity, uh, the less accurate indirect calorimetry becomes. The other problem or the other limitation is that when we use indirect calorimetry, again, we're assuming linearity here, okay? And we are assuming that all of the oxygen produced, I'm sorry, all of the oxygen used is being used in the electron transport chain. And you know, that's, that assumption is true all of the time whether it's aerobic or anaerobic, because that's the only place we use oxygen, okay? But we are also assuming that the CO2 that's being produced, okay, that we're measuring as it comes out of the lungs and into the machine, we're assuming that all of that CO2 that's produced is what we call metabolic CO2, okay? CO2 that was produced in the intermediate step, and in Krebs. And if the activity is primarily aerobic, that's true. Um, but as the intensity increases and as we add an anaerobic component, uh, 
and as we produce pyruvic acid at a greater rate, we actually start producing CO2 in the blood. Okay, so what happens is CO2 rises not because of metabolic reasons, not because of aerobic ATP production reasons, but because of buffering, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and therefore we lose the linearity between um, CO2 production, oxygen use. And this is going to throw off our RER, right? Because RER is VCO2 over VO2. And we're assuming when we calculate RER that that CO2 that's being produced is coming from these metabolic systems. But when we start producing CO2 in the process of buffering, VCO2 starts to rise disproportionately. And actually, RER can even go over 1. So remember that theoretically, RER can never go over 1. Okay? But if you see an RER over 1, you know that an, uh, there's a greater anaerobic component. Pyruvic acid is being created at a greater rate. You're probably producing some lactic acid. And so RER is no longer an accurate... Um, indicator of contributions of carbohydrate and fat. So RER as a measure of contributions of carbohydrate and fat is only going to be accurate low to moderate exercise. Okay, so let's explain where that other CO2 comes from. So in your bloodstream here, we have a chemical reaction that's going on and it's a buffering reaction. So as you know that when we start to produce pyruvic acid at a rate that's greater than it can be taken up by the mitochondria, we start to produce more and more lactic acid. Okay, And lactic acid is going to start to accumulate. And when lactic acid is produced, it starts to release hydrogen ions. Okay, so the more lactic acid we produce, the more hydrogen ions we produce. Okay, and here we are in the bloodstream. So we start to get a lot of hydrogen ions. And um, this formula here we'll actually talk about a lot for the remainder of the semester, so we will refer back to it often just as we did uh, this one. So when hydrogen ions rise, and we'll talk about mo more about this in another chapter, it causes the pH to drop. Okay. And this is detected by chemoreceptors. This is going to disrupt homeostasis, and it's going to trigger a response in order to bring the pH back up because it's now becoming too acidic. And so what happens is that we get something called <clears throat> bicarbonate ion that's released from the kidney, goes into the blood, and binds with hydrogen, Okay, forms something called carbonic acid, which immediately dissociates into CO2 and water. Okay, so we're not going to talk about carbonic acid anymore. And I just want you to know that there is something that occurs in between, but it's an unstable molecule, so it immediately dissociates into CO2 and water. So basically what's happening is the more lactic acid we produce, okay, the more hydrogen ions start to accumulate, the more buffering we get trying to fight this drop in pH. And in the process of buffering these hydrogen ions, we produce CO2. Okay? So CO2 starts to rise. CO2 production starts to rise. Not because we're making more CO2 from intermediate or from Krebs, but because we're making it in the blood in the process of buffering. Okay? So VCO2 is really going to start to rise. Um, disproportionate to VO2. Okay, VO2 is not going to continue to rise because it's only going to rise so high and therefore RER can go over 1. Okay, so theoretically we won't get an RER over 1 uh, 
and that is true if the situation is primarily aerobic. But the more we move away from aerobic and start to produce lactic acid and rely more heavily on anaerobic, we start to produce more and more CO2 and buffering, and therefore this formula loses linearity, and therefore indirect calorimetry is no longer an accurate measure. I also want to talk about what happens to RER after training. So again, remember that RER is an indication of fuel use. And an RER of 0.7 represents 100% fat. Okay. And an RER of 0.1 represents 100% carbohydrate. So at any point during exercise, assuming it was low to moderate intensity, we could measure your RER and have an idea of how much the contributions were coming from fat and carbohydrate. So if we take somebody before, after, before and after training and we put them at the same intensity, so for instance, let's say we put somebody on a treadmill at 7 miles per hour, okay, say this is a low to moderate intensity for the individual, we measure their RER, and then we train them. And after three months of training or so, we put them back on the treadmill at seven miles per hour, and we measure the RER again. Okay, How do you think the RER is going to change? Is the RER going to be higher after training or lower after training? Okay, So think about what the RER represents. Okay, if it's lower after training, that means more fat use after training. And if it's higher after training, that means a greater proportion of carbohydrate use after training. Okay, and we've talked about what happens with fuel use after training. So hopefully um, you've thought about it and it makes sense that after training, RER is going to be lower. Okay, it's going to be closer to 0.7. Okay, because we, as we established in Chapter 2, after training, you're able to use more fat. Your body wants to use fat. That's its first choice. Okay? And the reason that it doesn't um, with certain intensity of exercise is because fat can't keep up. Okay? But with training, fat becomes um, faster. Okay? So we get more FFA transporters. These are just some examples of things that happen. Um, we get an increase in capillary recruitment. We'll talk about that more later on. But basically, um, your capillaries are not all open at the same time. And so with training, you're better able to use the capillaries you have. If you can open more capillaries, you can bring more blood flow. You can deliver more fat to the muscle cells. We also get an increase in capillary density. We talked about that previously. So not only are we going to use more of the capillaries that we have, we're going to have more capillaries. And we're also going to have more, uh, and, and these two things, we're also going to have more intramuscular triglyceride stores. So more triglycerides stored right there in the muscle. And all three of these things are going to help increase the FFA delivery rate. And remember, that's one of the problems with fat metabolism is that it takes a long time for the fat system to speed up and for it to deliver the FFA to the muscle cells where it can get used. And so with training, these are some of the adaptations that occur that allow us to deliver fat faster, and therefore the body can use more fat, which is what it wants to do. So RER is going to go... Uh, is going to drop. It's going to get closer to 0 0.7 as we use more fat because we can. The other adaptation that occurs is we get a, adaptations with the beta oxidation enzymes. So the enzymes um, increase in number and activity. This is going to allow us to increase ATP production rate from fat. So again, fat becomes faster.
so we can use more fat. The advantage of this is that we spare glycogen. Remember that that's what the body wants to do. One of the reasons why the body prefers to use fat is because we have a finite amount of glycogen and the body wants to spare that as much as possible. So if you're able to use more fat, the body's happy. And we can also relate this to the crossover point. So remember, we talked about the crossover point in Chapter 2. Okay, so for crossover point, we have intensity on the x-axis, and we have percent uh, fuel use on the y. We have two lines. Okay, and then we have that crossover point. Okay, the red line represents fat use, and the blue line represents carbohydrate use. Okay. So as the intensity of exercise increases, fat contributes less and less, carbohydrate contributes more and more, and the crossover point is where the two fuels are contributing the same. Uh, before the crossover point, fat is primary. After the crossover point, carbohydrate is primary. With training, remember, this graph shifts to the right, okay? which means that the crossover point is going to occur at a higher intensity, which means that we were able to use primarily fat at a higher intensity than we did before training. Okay, so fat was a greater contributor for longer. So with training, what we see is that the crossover graph and the crossover point shift to the right. Okay, so everything switches over at a higher intensity.